Welcome to this evening's program hosted by the Tech Museum and the Commonwealth Club of Silicon Valley. I'm Angie Coro, hosting for the night. We're very proud to bring this to you as a collaborative effort of both groups. Obviously, you're here, so you know about the tech. Uh, if you would like to learn more about it, we're at thetech.org. And you can learn more about the Commonwealth Club at commonwealthclub.org. Keep it simple. And we hope you can join us for our upcoming events. On June 28th, we're hosting a special panel discussion called the Groupon Phenomenon. Speakers for that include Rob Solomon, former executive president of Groupon, Frank Sennett, editor-in-chief and president of Time Out Chicago, and author of Groupon's Biggest Deal Ever. And the moderator for that evening will be Kara Swisher. She's co-founder and co-executive editor of All Things D. Uh, July 29th, we have a free event for which we invite you to come in costume, if you care to. Bruce Scavalli is going to join me via Skype, and he's the author of Billion Dollar Batman. He knows everything you can imagine about Batman. The Dark Knight Rises opens in the Hackworth IMAX Dome Theater here July 20th. So on the 29th, we'll have a conversation via Skype. And again, costumes are welcome and encouraged. Sunday, August 27th, we'll be talking to William Clancy here in this room. He's chief scientist at NASA Ames Research, and he'll highlight some of his work with the Mars Exploration Rover. Tickets to any of those events can be purchased through the Tech Museum. You might notice on the chairs, you'll see some cards. Uh, there is a sheet that is a survey. We're always trying to find out how we can make our series better for you. So for this and for any other uh, of the lecture series you've attended, we'd love to get your opinions. Feel free to uh, fill that out. There's also a blank card. And Anna Lashinsky will make a presentation tonight, and I'll interview him afterward. I want to integrate your comments and questions into the interview. I'll ask you to keep them brief. I'll get to as many as I can. But if you have something to contribute while we're talking, just fill it out hold it up, and one of the volunteers will come to get it and bring it up here to me, and, and we'll integrate your questions that way. I think that's it. Again, a reminder to keep your cell phones off. Oh, one more thing. Uh, Adam will be staying to sign books after the event. If you brought one, good for you. And if you forgot to bring one along, the bookstore and gift shop is staying open late, and you will have time to run and grab one and come back and get it signed. Um, Adam is going to stay to sign books and say hello to you. And after that, it's my pleasure at this moment to introduce Adam Lashinsky to discuss with us his new book, Inside Apple, How America's Most Admired and Secretive Company Really Works. Adam is the senior editor-at-large for Fortune magazine, covering Wall Street and Silicon Valley. After graduating from the University of Illinois, he spent a year in Tokyo working as a reporter for the Nikkei Weekly. That's the English language version of Japan's Economic Daily. He came back to the U.S. and he joined Crane Communications in their Washington, D.C. bureau. He later moved to Chicago as a reporter and editor for Crane's Chicago business. And before he joined Fortune in 2001, Adam also worked as a columnist for TheStreet.com and the San Jose Mercury News. He's a weekly panelist on the Fox News channel's Cavuto on Business and frequently appears on other Fox News and Fox Business Network programs. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Wyszynski. It's a long way up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angie. I've been encouraged to stand and speak and then sit down and speak, speak with Angie. Um, I'd just like to amend one thing that Angie said, if it's not too presumptuous. Uh, as long as you keep it on silent, it'd be fine with me if you turned your smartphones back on, assuming that you want to tweet or Facebook about what I'm saying and tell people how interesting it is and encourage them to buy my book. It's, my handle is, Adam, is at Adam Lashinsky on Twitter, and it's also Adam Lashinsky on Facebook. So I hope I haven't broken any club rules in, in suggesting that to you. It's, um, it's, it's a privilege and, and great fun for me to be in San Jose because it's something of a homecoming for me. As Angie mentioned, I spent two wonderful years at the right before the dot-com uh, bubble burst at the San Jose Mercury News. I started a tech stocks column for the Mercury News. When I speak south of, uh, of 85, there's always a few people in the room who remember seeing my mug in, in the newspaper three times a week. It was a, a special and exciting time for me. And it turns out that it was relevant to the project that I embarked on last year, uh, or, which was uh, writing this book about Apple. Because I want to take you back for a moment to 1997 when I arrived in the Valley because it was an important year, as many of you know, for Apple. 
It was the year that first, uh, just weeks before 1997, Apple had purchased Steve Jobs' company, Next. It was the, in the summer of 1997 that Apple uh, fired Gil Emilio as CEO, and it was shortly after that that uh, Jobs, in his capacity as interim CEO or iCEO, it was the first time, by the way, that Apple publicly used this little I before something else. Uh, in this case, it stood for interim. It stood for it has stood for many, many things since then. Um, but it was also during this time that Apple got a what at the time was a rather humiliating $150 million investment from Microsoft. Uh, you'll remember that the investment from Apple's perspective gave them badly needed cash because Apple was running out of money at the time. It was 90 days from insolvency, as Steve Jobs liked to recount in later years. It also carried a commitment from Microsoft to continue making uh, Office for the Macintosh, which was critical. The Mac already was a low single-digit market share computer, and if it, if it didn't have Office, it would have been even worse for that, for that product. For Microsoft, interestingly, thinking back to 1997, this deal was important because it helped to ensure that Apple didn't go out of business, and the last thing that Microsoft wanted in 1997 was more heat from the Department of Justice because it had driven uh, its only credible uh, competitor out of business. So, thinking as a, as a, as a former uh, staff member at the San Jose Mercury News, I want to describe to you what it was like in the newsroom that summer and fall. For me, as a newcomer from Chicago, Everything that Apple did in 1997 was front page news in the Mercury News, and everybody was very excited about it in the newsroom, and everybody was very partisan about Apple. They were in favor of Apple. Apple was good, Microsoft was bad. There's many people who would still believe that to this day. My perspective as a newcomer to Silicon Valley was, Hey guys, I get the fact that Apple is the hometown company. I get the fact that they did really interesting things. I get the fact that Microsoft is mean. But, uh, first of all, it's not really our job to take sides between Apple and Microsoft. And secondly, I hate to tell you this, but Apple's kind of irrelevant. And I don't think I was wrong. This was a, this was a failing company in 1997. And when Steve Jobs uh, eventually took control of the company that year, he knew that it was a failing company. He knew that the company had changed for the worse in the, 11, in the 11 years that he had been gone. And so what are some of the things that he did that year, beginning that year? He fired a lot of people, approximately 4,000 middle managers. He, um, the following year, he hired uh, a supply chain and logistics executive from Compaq named Tim Cook to fix Apple's factory and warehouse problem. The problem was that Apple didn't want to have factories or warehouses anymore, and, he cl and Cook closed them. And he said, who's the best company in the industry in terms of manufacturing? It's Dell. How does Dell do it? They use contract manufacturers in Asia. That's what we're going to do. That's the legacy of what we, of what we have today with Apple's you know, outstanding yet controversial factories in China. It's because of what Tim Cook did starting in 1998. Um, and Jobs also found a divided and divisionalized company full of fiefdoms. And one of the things that he said was, we're no longer going to have fiefdoms at Apple there's going to be one feudal lord at Apple, and that's going to be me. And as an example of what he did, he confronted uh, as many as 16 advertise, advertising budgets that year in 1997. And he said, from now on, we're going to have one advertising budget at Apple. And if you're a manager trying to sell a product, you're going to come to me if you think it should have advertising dollars, and I'll decide whether or not your product deserves advertising dollars. That's no longer your job. This was not about cost cutting, by the way. Um, he cut costs in many other ways, but in terms of advertising, supporting the Apple brand, supporting Apple products, uh, Apple spent more money. And as, as a percentage of revenues, it spent even more money in the next few years, including in the recession of, of 2001. 
because Jobs understood that advertising and marketing were important to promote the, 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 the products that he and his colleagues were putting so much effort into. And um, as a result, as I said, advertising spending rose, but the idea was to foster one brand, one logo, one company, and to knock down these walls. And this is the company that persists to this day. Jobs did not value general management. General management is this concept that GE has popularized perhaps best in our time, that we should grow well-rounded leaders and expose them to different things and have them be uh, able to run whole parts of the business from top to bottom. And Jobs said, no, none of that. I'm going to run this whole business, and I'll hire people with deep expertise, whether it's in manufacturing, marketing, design, and so on, to do their functions, not generally, but specifically in, in different parts of the company. And, and this is really critical to understanding the Apple culture and the Apple mindset. At Apple, your job is to make products. Your job is not to make money. This is very difficult for MBAs to understand, and that's why Steve Jobs didn't particularly care for MBAs. Note that Tim Cook is an MBA, but we'll forgive him because he was a night school striver. He didn't, get it. He didn't go to a fancy uh, a business program. But your job was to make product and to do everything that was important to make the product good. That's how you'd make money, because you made a good product, and then the salespeople uh, uh, would sell it and the finance people would price it out and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I describe all this because I find that it's difficult for us in 2012 emotionally to remember what rotten shape Apple was in in 1997. And the, the most important thing that Jobs did that, that year, in addition to cutting people, closing factories, consolidating budgets, of various sorts was to strip the company down to its bare essentials in terms of the products that it offered. So when he came back, Apple made printers. Apple uh, made the Newton handheld organizer. It made um, a digital camera, which I didn't know until I, I, I didn't know when I, when I wrote the book, I came across this recently. He said, okay, none of that anymore. We're killing all those products and we're killing most of the computers as well. And for the time being, we're gonna make two laptops and two desktops. And that's all Apple did before the iMac came along uh, about a year later, and then later this digital hub strategy that we've come to know. So one last point on the good old days, and I also want to tell especially this audience, because my project in this book was to write about how Apple works, how it operates, how this great, admired, successful, valuable company uh, does what it does, I focused almost exclusively on the post-1997 period. I didn't write about and research the pre-97 period, which is of great interest to Apple watchers, but was not of interest to me, uh, to me professionally. So, what are some of the cultural characteristics of the, the, uh, the, the company that Apple is today? Because my thesis about Apple is that it does business differently from the way so many other businesses do business, and, and indeed from the way business is taught in business schools. I've had the opportunity, by the way, to speak at a few business schools, and I've said to them, if the world's most admired, most valuable, most successful company does business differently from the way you're teaching it, shouldn't you at least be asking the question, are we teaching it correctly in business school? I'm not saying I have the answer. I am saying I think they should be asking that question. So what are some of the tenets of Apple? Um, I'll start with a concept that I describe as a brain-dead, obvious business uh, concept that Apple practices every day. It's called the DRI. The DRI stands for the Directly Responsible Individual. When you go to a meeting at Apple, there will be a list of action items for, for the meeting. Next to each item is the name, is a name. That person is the DRI. They're the Directly Responsible Individual for that task. It means exactly what it sounds like it means. It means if, if, the, if, the, if the task fails, it's that person's fault, 
If it succeeds, by the way, they're not very likely to get a pat on the back because that's not the way Apple works. But you know who's to blame if it doesn't work, and you know whose job it is to reach out to different parts of the organization. So it's none of this sort of stuff that you see at other companies. It's no two in a box. It's no cross-divisional pollin pollination or whatever fancy terms that businesses use. It's the directly responsible individual. It predates Steve Jobs' return to the company in 97, by the way. This was part of the Apple culture even before he came back. Um, a similar vein, uh, Apple believes and Jobs would talk about the fact that it's more important to say no, even to good ideas, than it is to say yes. And over and over, Apple has institutionalized this notion that in order to be great, we should say no. So we should do fewer products rather than more. We should do fewer features rather than more. We should attack fewer markets rather than more. This explains why for 10 years, Apple had virtually no direct strategy for selling to big businesses, to the enterprise. Be partly because the company had been burned in the 80s on the enterprise, but also because it recognized we've got our hands full trying to uh, attack the consumer market, so we're not going to pay attention. We're not going to do a phone until they did do a phone. Um, they're also very judicious with their time. So many companies will send their people to conferences. They'll have junior level executives out meeting people and schmoozing and looking for ideas. Apple does none of this. Why in the world would they want somebody to go to an industry panel and talk about their approach? Their approach is to be back in Cupertino at their desks working all of the time because time is scarce and they've got a lot to do and they're very busy people. And I know some of this sounds exaggerated. It's not. Trust me on this. Um, and then one last cultural attribute that's in line with all of this is the notion, there's on the one hand, there's the notion of saying no, and a corollary to that is the importance of simplicity. So Apple preaches to its people the need for simplicity. And you know, you don't have to, you, you don't need any fancy pictures to understand simplicity. You look at the iPhone or you look at the iMac and you think about all the things that come with your PC when you open the box. And then you think about everything that comes with your iMac when you open the box. Nothing. You get a monitor and a keyboard. Um, by the way, the, you also think about simplicity. Think about what you see on the PC screen when you turn it on versus what you see on the iMac screen when you turn it on. If anybody's bought a PC at retail, you know what I'm talking about. It's what Steve Jobs referred to as crapware. <laughs> the crapware are all the little things, all the come-ons that the manufacturers put on the screen to try to sell you something to improve their margins. And I like to say that Apple is not perfect. I never have suggested that Apple is perfect. But it doesn't try to insult its customers within the first 20 minutes of their using their products. And to illustrate my point about simplicity, if you're ever fortunate enough to visit the product marketing building uh, in Cupertino at one, uh, uh, on, on the Apple campus, the people who work in that building have to go by a wall after they badge in in order to get to their desks. And on that wall, I have a beautiful slide that I don't have to show you tonight. It's, it is printed three words, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. These are marketers, remember. They're being encouraged about how to do their marketing messages. And the, only, the part that I haven't told you that is, yet is that there's a line drawn through the first two simplicities. <laughs> do I have a little more time, Angie? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll just spend a few minutes talking. And by the way, I, uh, somebody who's familiar with my work is saying, when is, when's he going to talk about secrecy? Uh, I'm not going to talk about secrecy. I'll let you ask me about, about secrecy. It's gotten the most attention in, in my book, and so I like, I'm trying to talk about some of the, uh, the less known a, a, and really positive qualities uh, of Apple, other, other than its extreme secrecy. And so what I'll close with is talking a little bit about how good Apple is at marketing. You all know how good, that, that Apple is very good at marketing. You all know that they do uh, beautiful ad advertising. But, but let me tell you for, for a moment um, the how they're so good at it. it. It really comes down to two things. One, they're very clear about what their message is. They craft the message carefully, down to the word. A thousand songs in your pocket. 
Think back to when the iPod was released and everybody else was marketing megabytes or gigabytes. I can't remember what the byte situation was then. Apple said a thousand songs in your pocket. A third grader could understand that. Um, someone who was completely afraid of technology could understand that. And as important as crafting the message is delivering the message. And I describe an executive who was one of the five executives authorized to speak about the iPhone. Think about that, five. That did not include some of the most senior executives who worked on the iPhone, who explained to me that when you deliver the message publicly, we've already scripted what the message is, and your tendency as a human being to entertain yourself, if nothing else, is to mix it up, to vary the message. That's the wrong approach. You want to say it exactly as we scripted it every single time. Why? Because the person you're talking to is hearing it for the very first time. And you want them to repeat it to their friends and to their friends and to their friends until it comes back into the marketplace the way we wrote it. So one is, is, is honing your message and delivering it clearly. And the other is a fun one, which is spending as much money as it takes to deliver the message. Now, I know you're thinking a company with $110 billion on its balance sheet can spend a lot of money to do whatever it wants, but Apple has always believed in spending lavishly where it's appropriate, on design, on manufacturing, and indeed on marketing. And I'll tell you very quickly about a story in my book about when iMovie HD, high def, came out in 2005. Um, again, hard for us to remember, but there was a time when high def was brand new. There weren't a lot of cameras, there weren't a lot of televisions, and Apple has always been very good about evangelizing new technology. And they were going to integrate a high def version of iMovie into their Mac software. They knew that people used iMovie to shoot movies, amateur, amateur videos of, of uh, I'm sorry, of weddings. So they wanted a wedding, and they shot a wedding at the Presidio, at the Officers Club on the Presidio. It was an Apple employee's wedding. And it was a beautiful wedding, and they showed the footage to, job, to Jobs, and characteristically, he hated it. He said, it's too somber, it's too dark, it's elegant, yes, but boring. I want something tropical. I want to see feet in the sands, uh, the sunset coming down, Hawaii, maybe. This was three weeks before Macworld. So the Apple product marketing team called a talent agency in, in Los Angeles. They said, do you have a model or an actress? Because remember, this is Apple ads. They have to be beautiful people because you're going to be beautiful when you buy this product. Do you know anyone getting married shortly before New Year's that we could shoot their wedding? They, they found somebody. They sent a crew at tremendous expense. They scouted the sunset a, a day early. They agreed to buy the flowers and, a video and, and provide a video to the bride, and they shot the wedding, and they sent it back to Cupertino. Steve Jobs loved it, and um, Macworld happened days later, and this was all for a 30-second clip. And it didn't matter. The expense didn't matter. They achieved their goal of showing the beauty of high-definition home-shot videos using iMovie on the Mac, and that's part of what Apple marketing is all about. And I'll leave it at there and, listen, and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And a reminder, if you do have questions as we go along, just hold up the card you've written it on, and a volunteer will come pick that up and bring them up to me. Let's start where you left off. I love that anecdote. I found myself wondering, You've put together a mosaic of the people, the mentality, the secrecy. We will get into the secrecy because it is a big story. When you look at an incident like that, how do you tease out or can you tease out how much each of these pieces matter? How much difference does it make to Apple's success that they ran wedding B instead of wedding A? Or is that more a sign of the idiosyncrasies of the guy at the top? So um, I understand the question, and um, I've, I've given that plenty of thought in my, in my research, and I'm very confident that it's, um, that this is not a, mo this is, this is a cohesive mo mosaic, and these are not idiosyncrasies. So what, what this, this is an example, and the example is that at every step of the process, we will do whatever it takes to delight the customer. And so this is a, and, and so in recounting this, and I have, I have 20 more of these, it's a lesson. 
And the lesson, and, and, and Jobs was a preacher. He, he's called many things. I've never thought of that exact, um, is that a metaphor or analogy? I guess a metaphor, right? I don't know. I'm, the, I'm a writer, but um, he would, he was, he, he used these examples to teach. And the lesson was, when we're manufacturing, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes to get the look exactly as we want it. When we're designing, we will do 500 iterations if that's what it takes to get the design just right. And when we're preparing to show it to, uh, to our customers, we will get, in our opinion, and that maybe that's what you're getting at, in our aesthetic opinion, the exact right image to illustrate it. Now, are you asking, will, uh, will, would, would normal human beings uh, throw away a perfectly good wedding to get a better wedding, uh, um, I, I don't know. I don't think that, that to try to do that would be terribly unusual in the advertising industry. To do it the way Jobs did it certainly was unusual, but I think we all know the, what the results have been like. You set out to document life inside Apple knowing that life inside Apple is probably going to change. So as, as we approach talking about the book as a whole, how much of this do you feel was taking the inventory of the place at the cusp of the change of granted Steve Jobs has passed away? Well, so I did the, um, it's, a, it's, an inter it's, a, it's a fair point in that a lot of my reporting over the last several years was with the knowledge that sooner or later Steve Jobs would be gone. So sure, I knew there was going to be change, but I actually don't think that change was preeminent in my mind. As a matter of fact, when I, when I wrote the, article, the initial article in Fortune, Steve, Steve Jobs was the CEO still, and when I, when I embarked on the book, I had no idea, and most people outside of a small inner circle had no idea that he wouldn't be around much longer. Because remember, if you read Walter Isaacson's biography, he had cheated death several times, and even people close to him felt that he was going, going to continue to, to do that. So. I wasn't trying to capture a moment. I was trying to describe how this excellent company operates. And one of my goals was there's the, because there's all this, there are all these myths around Apple, because, the, because of the secrecy, because what we saw was Steve Jobs, we didn't see all the other very talented people, there was a lack of understanding about their, their excellence beneath the layer other than this one person. That is one of the things I was trying to describe, and, and much of that continues completely unabated and has nothing to do with his passing. It has a lot to do with things that he did, ways he influenced the culture, processes that he instituted, things that he oversaw, but I, I wasn't, and I wasn't I'm not necessarily anticipating that those things are going to end. Talk about the culture of Apple and how it selects who wants to work there. And I think reading the book, people will be surprised to discover the perks that an Apple worker doesn't get. It, it, you, we're sure. so used to hearing about the chef being brought in and right. about, you know, you can run your whole life on the campus. Go ahead and talk about that. Sure. So Apple's a hard place to work. It's a, there's a lot of pressure. It's stressful. There are long hours. There are a lot of demands made on you. And as I mentioned, it's not a culture of backslapping. Uh, when, when, the, when a task is done, uh, it's assumed that you're probably exhausted and might want to take a vacation. And, and as soon as that's over, you're going to get back to work immediately. Um, and it's also, uh, unlike so many other companies, and Google's the easiest one to use as the counterpoint, but it's not the only one. Apple does not have this mentality of trying very hard to entertain its employees. It doesn't treat work as being some sort of day at the amusement park. It treats it as work. And so, for example, there's no free lunch at Apple. You pay for your lunch at Apple. They're very proud that the cafeteria serves good food, but it's, they don't give it to you. And they, they don't expect to coddle their people. In fact, they don't, and they also don't expect their people to, to, uh, to beat their chests and brag about the fact that they work at Apple. They want them to keep their mouths shut and work at Apple. And the reward should be the fact that they work for the greatest company on earth. And again, not an exaggeration in terms of the, mind, the, corporate, the corporate mindset. Uh, they're winners. They win all the time. And guess what? Winning isn't easy. 
So that answers what was going to be my next question, which is who, if you're not getting the top money in the valley and you're not getting the perks and you don't have a lot of, of communication culture around you and that family-like feeling, is that it? Is it the people who like to work hard and win? Those are the ones who self-select for Apple? I think that's right. Uh, I, I, when, when, especially when I started working on this project, I would ask people, is it fun to work at Apple? Or, or are, I would say, are Apple people happy? The response would be, Apple people have a very clear sense of mission. And I'd say, yeah, but I asked you, is it fun and are people happy? And they'd say, Apple people get, gr take great pride in looking around the room and seeing people using iPhones and iPads and, 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 uh, and MacBook Pros. And I said, you know, okay, I'm, you know, I'm slow but not stupid. I get it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's pride of accomplishment, among other things. I don't uh, by the way, we should not make the mistake of assuming that Apple people are poorly paid. And we also shouldn't, and it's also important to note that the, the brave few who went back in those early days got what I believe is referred to in the financial industry as stinking rich. <laughs> because the stock was so low, they got generous stock grants and they made a lot of money. But today, if, if money were your number one priority, that's not where you'd end up. No, and culturally, Apple frowns on not only talking about money in terms of how much money are we going to make, make it with the product, it's also not a culture that, that celebrates uh, earning money either. A question These are from generalizations, the of course. Excuse me for interrupting. I mean, uh, clearly there's, there's, there's going to be ostentatious people or, or whatever somewhere in the organization, but generally that's what the culture is like. A question from the audience about how and how much Apple was supportive of your efforts to study the company. And if they weren't, how did you get insiders to open up? Thank you for that question. Um, they were not particularly supportive uh, or, or cooperative of, of my project. And, and let me explain why. I'm, I've, I, not only am I not bitter and do I have no animosity, but I completely understand why. And it's part of my thesis. Remember I told you, at Apple, there's only one word that matters. It's product. So that applies to public relations as well. And I think this is something other companies might think about. Why do you do public relations? You do public relations to sell products, not to convince people that the executives are interesting or that the company is very profitable because the financial statements point to that and so on. You do PR to sell products. You don't do PR to answer uh, fortune writers' questions about how it is that we do what we do. So. Generally speaking, professionally speaking, they were not interested in my subject. Now, they weren't unfriendly or unkind, they, and they weren't completely uncooperative either. They just weren't, um, they didn't welcome me with open arms uh, on this. And um, how I did it was with, uh, you know, old-fashioned investigative reporting. I spoke to, I, I, I keep asking how many, and I get asked how many, and I don't know how many, but I would guess many scores of people, mostly ex-Apple employees, from all levels of the organization. So your typical corporate reporting is you go talk to the CEO and a few top executives, and then you, you do other research and you write the story. For my purposes, people who were very low down in the organization are as valuable as people who were very high up in the organization, and I spoke to all of them. And so I painted this picture, a mosaic, if you will, from, from speaking to those people. You've reported on other companies, obviously. You've been in the business of business reporting for a long time. And I wonder about the theme that you come back to constantly, which is the need to know. Mm -hmm. it, you know, Everything at Apple is done on a need to know basis. You even mentioned that a boss may not be allowed into the same room as his employees if his employee needs to know more than he does about that or than she does. When you went to find out how the company works, did your experience talking to the former employees show up in that? Did, was it clear you were talking to someone who had a very stratified, narrow knowledge? Yes, and, 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 and the, the experience repeats itself all the time. So, I mean, I spoke to someone today who told me, well, you have to understand that my experience is very narrow and all I, all I know about is my little area of the company. And um, so, but if you speak to 15 people who explain that my knowledge is very narrow, and I only know what I know, now you understand part of the way that they operate. This is, this is not a mistake. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen by happenstance, it happened by design. And so um, people, to anticipate, uh, you know, another question is people say, well, if nobody knows anything, then how does it get integrated and, and how does it work so well to make, to make this thing that, that you have in front of you? And, and the answer is it's a very, it's a hierarchical organization, like a military organization, 
in that the, the, the general, the commander in chief is very powerful and has some general staff members, generals or admirals, who are also very powerful. And the company manages down. They give orders down to what people are supposed to do. At the same time, people manage up. There's a cadence at Apple. This word cadence is very important, by the way. Um, Jobs would talk about the Monday product review meeting. It's a really interesting statement because some companies will have quarterly product review meetings at the highest level. Apple has a weekly product review meeting at the highest level. Junior people told me their job was preparing their boss, whose job it was to prepare their boss and their boss and so on for this executive team meeting. The effect would be, again, very, very young junior people would tell me, as a junior person, you know your work is getting reviewed very regularly by the CEO or by the executive, by the executive team members, and you will get feedback. And the feedback typically will be either carry on or uh, a, a variety of vulgarities to the effect of you're not doing good work and you need to change. What's your impression of the downside of the need to know culture there? Well, um, I think the downside's obvious. For, the, for certain people, it can lead to bad morale. And it also does not, by definition, uh, form well-rounded business people. It, uh, it forms um, functionally oriented uh, business people. It, you know, think again of a military organization. It, uh, it, 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 it forms highly specialized, trained killers, not leaders of men and women, not, dis not necessarily decision makers. It's funny that you, that you use the killer analogy because the terrorist analogy was thrown out there by an earlier employee of Apple, that these are the same way you do terrorist cells. And I will tell you that Apple hates it when that comes up in my various public comments, and I, I don't blame them. The, um, the, a kinder way of referring to it, it would be more charitable to compare them to a resistance organization because resistance organizations are noble and are, are, fighting the good, are fighting the good fight. But the point is the same. You, the different cells in the organization don't communicate with each other and don't have information about each other for fear that they might divulge that information to the wrong person. A uh, question from the audience. How much of Apple's culture is a product of Steve Jobs' mind? His mind? Um, well, I don't know about his mind. You know, he, he, it's, it's interesting that we're starting to... We, we're starting to understand who he really was, and it's, it's very difficult with a public personality, but in my experience, both experiences personally and what I've read, first of all, it's no exaggeration that he was brilliant. He was, a, he was a genius in his ability to understand a lot of information and synthesize it, number one. And I, I lead with that synthesis, whereas most people lead with his brilliance in terms of, you know, a design aesthetic, which was also genius. But he... He, he, he was that rare person who had this design aesthetic, but also understood business very well. He also understood people very well. He understood strategy very well. Um, he, you know, there hasn't been enough written about what happened between the time that he left Apple and the time that he came back. Because he left this brash young man who had failed out of the company that he had founded, and he came back and over the next 14 years became one of the greatest CEOs we've ever seen. That's, a, that's really a bold statement. And so his mind, if, if that's the question, his mind informed all, everything that we know about Apple. Do you think there are gaps in the, autobi or in the biography that need to be discussed? I'm just intrigued that you said that needs to be covered more. Yes, uh, but, but in, in any, and I'm a, I have nothing but praise for, for Walter Isaacson personally and, and his book, but um, you know, he only spent three years on it approximately, and Jobs was a, was a giant figure of our time, and yeah, there's, in, in the way that, uh, you know, PhD students do monographs on subjects that have been written about for a hundred years, there, there are many more, uh, there's, there are many more works to be done on Steve Jobs and Apple, in my opinion. I had a couple questions about the nature of Steve Jobs himself, the anecdotes about people getting in an ele elevator with him by the time it ends up at the floor, he's been fired. Yeah. Are most of those stories true? My honest answer is I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I don't disbelieve them, but I don't, I don't have first-hand knowledge of them. The, there are many stories of his you know, abrupt, rude, unkind, unfeeling, terse behavior with direct subordinates, with people he didn't know, 
So that makes the stories believable. There's a story in your book about design that mimicked my experience. It was either the Mac or the, pro, the uh, book I got before that, the MacBook I got before that. And I remember when it arrived, and I've, I've had Macs for years now, but even so, with this new item, I remember opening the box and being so struck by the hand feel of that cardboard. Mm -hmm. This was not just Joe Schmo cardboard. This had been yeah. selected. It felt like satin. And it turns out that every little detail, how it opens, which color arrow you're looking at when you open it, and you know, then eventually, of course, we get to your story of the room in which some of this testing takes place. Yeah, so I describe the package design room, a lockdown room with secure badges, and, and like many other rooms on the Apple campus, where a package designer uh, pr uh, was holed up with prototype boxes for the iPod, practicing this thing that you, that you mentioned, opening and closing the little piece of adhesive tape with an arrow on it, making sure that it, that it was placed correctly and that, and that it was a good experience when you opened it. And, and other things as well. And the, and you know, I, 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 I ham up this description. The, the, you can picture this person over a period of weeks opening and closing and opening and closing and opening and closing, which sounds like bizarre behavior, unless <laughs> there's anyone in the room who has recently bought an iPod or an iPhone or an iPad and you peeled back that little piece of adhesive tape and you opened the box and you saw your gorgeous device stacked neatly, by the way, on some really gorgeous literature, and you picked it up, and it felt really smooth, and you loved holding it in your hand, and you felt like a better person for holding it in your hand, and you understand this person peeling back little pieces of tape for weeks on end. And yes, that is magnified over and over and over. And my point in telling the story is that, you know, we understand the devotion to getting the machining just right on the iPhone, but Apple doesn't stop there. They carry it forward to a piece of cardboard and even more mundane, a piece of tape. <laughs> How much do you see other companies finally getting that? There's li relatively, relatively little evidence that other companies do get it. And, um, you know, I would like business school professors to study why, because they have some, they have quantitative abilities that I don't have. My, um, my high level instinctive explanation is that, that the other companies don't have the guts to do it. They're cowards. So Apple does these things at great expense. They bet the company. They bet the company every time they do a major product, a really major product, with the last one being the iPad. Now, it's getting hard for them to bet the company with $110 billion on the balance sheet. And more importantly, I would argue, is the Macintosh itself. The Macintosh is a cash cow now. It's an annuity for Apple. And so that, that will enable them to continue to be really bold in terms of their bets. But the, some of the bets they've made in the past could have crippled the company. The bet they made on, uh, on, on flash memory, for example, when they, when they switched over the iPod they, and, and they first invested billions of dollars to effectively corner that market, that could have crippled the company. The investments they made to manufacture and then um, build up inventory for the iPhone, had that product been a dud, could have crippled the company. In fact, while we're on the iPhone, uh, do you think Apple's iPhone was so successful thanks to its closed architecture or in spite of it? Um, So I, I should start by I should start with a hedge, an unApple like hedge, which is that I, my edge is not my uh, my product knowledge. I read the same product uh, blogs and gossip blogs that everybody else reads, and so I've been able to carve out a niche explaining their business practices. So with that as a as a as a caveat. Uh, I, I think they've succeeded with these products and, and with their with, with all of their products because of, of the because of the fact that they're a closed system, not in spite of it. Talk about the experience of a new employee first day on the campus. New employee, uh, first of all, is you've been you've gone through a rigorous uh, hiring process where you've interviewed multiple times, and depending on your level, not necessarily a very high level, up to you will have interviewed at a very high level at, at Apple. And um, you aren't necessarily sure what job you're going to do just because you've accepted a job at Apple. One of the reasons you're not sure is that you haven't been told. And the reason you haven't been told is that you have not demonstrated that you can be trusted yet. 
You have demonstrated that you're worth hiring, but you, haven't been dem you have not demonstrated your trustworthiness. So you go on your, on your first day of work, which is on a Monday, to new employee orientation, and you learn all the things that new employees learn at other companies. One of the things you learn, by the way, is that you're going to have to set up your newly issued computer by yourself. There is no IT help to, to set up your computer because if you can't figure out how to hook up a computer to a printer, you probably shouldn't be working at Apple. You also uh, are given a security briefing by an Apple security officer, and it is explained to you how and why Apple takes secrecy so seriously. And it will be, you'll be explain, it'll be explained to you that if you divulge the company's secrets, you'll probably be fired. And if we can prove the financial damage that you've caused, we may sue you as well. And remember, this is your first day of work. That puts that poor guy who lost the iPhone the, in Redwood City, that puts that in a whole different light. You know, I, it's, I, I love the, the topic because, uh, you know, the Apple faithful are, are, are conspiracy theorists by nature, and the people want to believe that Apple put that, 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 that they left that phone in the bar on purpose, and uh, I don't believe it. I really don't believe it. I, I agree with you. I feel sorry for that person. Yeah, it, it, it's out of keeping with everything that you're documenting in the company. It That's is. not them. It contradicts my reporting. You're right. Another comparison I'd like you to make, I was trying to wrap my mind around your report that it was a grand total of two people who wrote the, cur the code that converted Apple's Safari browser for the iPad. Right. And uh, give me a point of comparison in, in an average company or a different company, how, how many people would be working on that? Well, I'm not a software engineer, so it's, it's hard for me to make a, a factual comparison, but the, the bias at Apple is towards small groups. And so the, 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 the bias is that a, that a small group can get something done better than a large group. And so the, the, you know, and the metaphor for this would be a startup. Startups are small groups. There's a reason why startups accomplish what they accomplish, because a small group of people who know each other well, who understand how each other thinks and works, can, can accomplish great tasks. And so across the company, small, com small groups, small teams, We'll work, on, uh, we'll work on very important projects. And by the way, Apple's not the only company to do this. For many years, uh, Amazon had a, what they called a two pizza rule, that the, uh, the team needs to be no bigger than could be fed on uh, two pizzas if they're working late at night. <laughs> and at Apple, you pay for the pizza. And I think, you know, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I'm pretty sure I've been told that there are exceptions for working late at night for the company picking up the food. Someone asked about something I planned to ask you about anyway, which was the release of the Microsoft uh, tablet yesterday. Yeah. And uh, the, the way the question is phrased, how would Steve Jobs have felt about how Microsoft took a page out of his PR playbook for their tablet release yesterday? Well, I think the, 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 the reference is to the fact that Microsoft had a hush-hush event that they invited journalists to relatively at the, last, at the relative last minute. And... Um, I, I, it's funny, I was in Los Angeles less than a, less than a few miles from the event because I, I was giving a talk about Apple and uh, the timing didn't work out. I, I could have gone to the event if it had been just an hour later or if my thing had been an hour earlier. And, um, you know, Jobs, Jobs knew that other companies were going to take uh, a page out of the playbook regarding tablets. He said so in one of his last appearances when they released the uh, iPad 2, I believe it was, or was it the new, yeah, it was the iPad 2. So, um, you know, I can only assume that he was as befuddled as the rest of us are that more companies don't emulate Apple in more ways, including their, their PR approach. I'll point out to you, I, since I've been traveling and speaking, I haven't really paid careful attention to Microsoft's product announcement. One of the, one of the facets of their announcement yesterday was they said that the product was going to be available later this year. Um, that's not a particularly Apple way of, of, of doing things. Apple tries to have something available today, and if not today, in two weeks, and they'll, they'll state the date. Wasn't the case, by the way, last a week ago, Monday, when they announced a whole bunch of software features for, at the Worldwide Developers Council Conference, they said that these things would be available in the fall. So they weren't exactly following their playbook there either. One of the announcements, or one of the reactions to the new Microsoft tablet came out in SFist, and they were quoting what they note as uh, an Apple fanboy. And uh, they talk about his swooning review of the Microsoft tablet. And knowing we were going to talk tonight, I wondered if that camp that you referred to while you were talking, that Microsoft evil, Apple is great, and you know, the opposite idea for people who don't like Apple or think it's stupid, is that starting to blend? Is that, is that blurring 
that distinction between Microsoft, because apparently this is a writer who is all Apple all the time, and he's singing the praises of Microsoft. Is that significant? Well, is it significant? I mean, let me make a couple observations. Um, you know, some fanboys and fangirls, uh, you know, more kindly referred to as the Apple faithful, are very emotional about Apple, and, and then they, they always have been. And so they'll, they'll, they'll be predisposed to favor Apple almost no matter what. Um, but, but many of the Apple faithful are technology lovers and consumer technology lovers, and they're intellectually honest. So, you know, they've seen a lot of garbage in their time from other companies, especially that company. And so I assume that this person was being intellectually honest, that they, they, loved, they loved it, and there's no reason why. It's not theoretically impossible for someone other than Apple to make a beautiful product. Um, but the other observation I want to make is that the, di the dynamic that I've observed is that you know, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks that I didn't understand what all the fuss was about in 97 about Apple. I also was not an Apple user. I was a PC user. I hadn't used a Mac since college. And when I got to Fortune, I also demanded to have a PC, even though Fortune is a Mac shop on the editorial side. Because I, like most of the world, was just more comfortable in the Windows environment. I, go, I use both now. I'm still more comfortable in, in the PC environment for a variety of reasons. My point, however, is that 12, 15 years ago, uh, it was fanboys and fangirls who cared about Apple and who scrutinized Apple and watched Apple's product releases. Now, we all do. And we are the reason that Apple's a you know, half a trillion dollar plus market cap company, not because of the, of the faithful. They were going to buy the products anyway. The fact that Apple's been able to sell products to me I bought an iMac with my own money. I now have a company-issued iPhone. I have a MacBook Pro from, from the office. I have an iPad that I bought with my own money. You know, these are, that's the, re I think that's the metaphor for their, for their success. There are already people conjecturing about the future of Apple beyond Tim Cook. Now, he's supposed to be there through, is 2021, is that correct? Well, what you're referring to is that uh, when he became CEO last August, he received a 10-year um, stock, a, a stock grant, a, a stock grant that vests in two periods, one over five years and the other over 10 years. So you can, you can, uh, what you can say factually is that he has financial incentives to stay for 10 years. Got it. And what we already see conjecture in, in some of the coverage of who might be next in line behind him if he doesn't stay, who comes up behind him. Is a lot of that, from your talk with the people inside Apple, the kind of thing the insider's obsessed with, or are they so focused on work they're not, they're not there with that? Is it a gossipy place? Well, Apple, by, uh, generally speaking, is not a gossipy place. It's, it's not a political place because, uh, as I've described, people are too busy and they don't have enough information with which to play politics, internal corporate politics. Having said that, everybody who's interested in Apple, and that certainly includes Apple employees, are obsessed with the topic of, of what the leadership of the company will look like. They're more, um, right now, the, the, topic, the topic of the day is who's going to make the critical decisions that only Steve Jobs made before? On the assumption that Tim Cook doesn't have all the same skills, and he doesn't, that Steve Jobs had. Who will make that decision, you know, to scrap a billion dollar project the way Steve Jobs would, and, and, and the reverse of that. So yes, they're, they're very, uh, they are very interested in who's going to lead the company. Having said that, we know who's leading the company. There, there's no doubt about that right now. It's Tim Cook. What does it indicate that he opened up a philanthropic idea that the company hadn't had before? What does that tell you? I was shocked to find out they didn't even have matching grant programs for right. charities. And that's what he, that's what he instituted uh, shortly after he became CEO, while Steve Jobs was still alive, by the way, as a you know, relatively modest program, a $10,000 matching grant for U.S. employees of Apple. Um, it indicates a few things. The, the employees wanted this. The reason they didn't have it is that Steve Jobs didn't have any patience for corporate philanthropy. He didn't have any patience for philanthropy. He certainly didn't have any patience for corporate philanthropy. He thought it was stupid. He thought, and the, the way he would describe it was that he was uh, politically liberal, for example, and he didn't think that, the, uh, that he should be making decisions on behalf of the shareholders who might not share his political beliefs uh, to, in terms of how to spend the company's money on philanthropy. He preferred to make money for the shareholders and let them give their money to charity. What it reflected in, in Tim Cook's early decision, his really first public decision as CEO, was that he wanted to do this to make, because the employees wanted it. And he thought it was an easy way to make the employees happy. 
And he also thought that it was important. He has said so publicly since then that he thinks co companies should give back. It wasn't, it was important culturally, but it was, a mar it was marginally important. It's not a wholesale reordering of the Apple culture, but it was certainly a small tweak to the Apple culture. What other changes would you look for in the near future? Well, in the, in the near future, what changes would I look for? You know that's the technique for temporizing because I don't have a quick answer to it. <laughs> um, you know, Cook I, has I, made some comments to the effect that, he's, that he, hates, he hates all the litigiousness that Apple's involved in right now, and he'd like to get that behind him, which I, behind the company, which I completely believe. Um, I think that, I don't know if it's a change, but you know, students of Apple will be watching their advertising very carefully because we know that, that Jobs was, was so intimately involved personally with the advertising. And so it will be of great interest to people who care about that sort of thing if they will be able to have as magical advertising, for example. The, the things that will change in the next couple of years will, will all be these sort of, sort of incremental things that either we will overanalyze or we won't know that they were changes until we add them all up and we realize that, oh yeah, these 20 things constitute change. It, there was something I wanted to ask you about the advertising and the question would not form. I'm going to throw you the half-formed question. Great. I know all about half-formed questions, I, Angie. Yeah, because I know I want to ask you about it, but I don't know what I want to ask you about it. The more you learn about Apple, the more you see a disconnect between its public image and, and its real interior life. And yes. of course, no company is going to hang its guts out in its commercials. Marketing is right. a process message, but it just seems more so here. And I, just, I want you to comment on how different it looks from the outside than it is from the inside. I understand your, 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 um, you know, your question and you're your sort of searching for the right way to characterize it. Here's my way of characterizing it. Uh, Apple is a company of paradoxes and Steve Jobs was a, was a person of paradoxes. So, you know, he could be alternately charming and brutal uh, on the same day in the same, in, over the course of the same meeting. Uh, the company has this whimsical notion, they want people to think of it as being a happy-go-lucky place, but it's not a happy-go-lucky place uh, on the inside. They want to encourage people to think that their products give them, uh, that give, co give consumers the freedom to do great things, which is true. While at the same time, as one of the questioners has already pointed out, they, in terms of technology, they are completely against freedom. They are for, they are for the absence of freedom, a closed environment. Um, this is, and, and I'm, you know, I have more paradoxes that, that, I, I, that I've, I need to make a list because there are many of these. That's the way Apple is. It's paradoxical. Do you think that we'll be seeing any change in their advertising? I mean, you can, you can look at their series of commercials, especially their television commercials especially, and see the spirit of the person they wanted to treat you as the consumer to be. Yeah. You're the one dancing in silhouette, you know, with, with your earbuds in, and yeah. you're the one who's smashing the old, the old party and how things are done. Do you think we're going to see a different public face for Apple? Well, no, but I'm not creative or you know visionary enough to to foresee that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the bloggers, for example, have made a big deal about them having celebrities like Samuel L. Jackson in their in their Siri ads, and the, the you know again people analyzing everything to, to to death in terms of well, is this a big change because Apple hasn't used celebrities before? It's not really true. They they used celebrities in the Think Different campaign. They had. John Hodgman in, in, the, in the Mac versus PC campaign. But um, no, I, I think they'll continue to celebrate the consumer because it's worked so well for them and because it's this just wonderfully insidious, in a positive sense, technique that they've led where they advertise to consumers and they win all this business in businesses because consumer is another, way, another word for employee and the employees have demanded uh, Apple products and they're just kicking butt inside the enterprise now without ever having focused overtly on the enterprise. We've reached the point in our program where we have time for just one more comment, and I want to grab on something that you just said, and that is the bloggers, the attentiveness to every move that Apple makes, whether it's accurate or not. Oh, they've never used celebrities. They are eternal. Apple is so fascinating, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in the business world, but to arts people and to people of all walks. 
What is the magic of Apple that we're all so fascinated? Well, you, you know, you need, this, this would be a question I, I genuinely believe for, you've given me a good idea of something I can research because I think this is a question for, you know, a philosopher, a theologian, a psychologist, an anthropologist, or a, um, a comparative literature professor, okay? So bear with me for a moment. And, you know, I think Apple speaks to the fact that we all want to be better. We want to be beautiful. We want to be perfect. We want to be things we aren't, in short. So we want to, when we're sad, we want to be happy. We are, we're very busy, and we, that's because we have mortgages and college educations to pay for and bosses to answer to. We want to be that person skipping down the street, listening to a groovy tune with a, with a cool fashion aesthetic hanging, hanging, hanging from our ears. And so, you know, I'm sort of, first I'm doing it in flowery terms. I also think that because Apple truly tried to be different from the competition, they were different. So they gave us as consumers something that was different from you know, the boring stuff that the competition gave us. And that created their image of being something that certain consumers loved and identified with and yearned for. And, and that's why I suggested some of those softer sciences that might, that might explain it better than I can. Personally, though, for you too, is it because you're one of the consumers who wants to be better, who wants to be... <laughs> no, I, I mean... I your own fascination. First of all, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a technophile. Uh, I'm not a gadget freak. Uh, I'm a, like, uh, I, I think, I, I lived in Japan for, for a year, and, and I described my, my um, relationship with technology the same way I described my, my knowledge of Japanese when I lived in Japan. If you spoke Japanese fluently, you would have thought, you would have known that I was a foaming at the mouth foreigner who could barely speak Japanese. If you were an American, for example, with no knowledge of Japanese, you would have thought, well, I spoke Japanese quite well because I could communicate. Um, and I'm, I'm better than people who are Luddites or who are afraid of technology, but compared to, you know, some of the great technologists and technophiles in Silicon Valley, I'm, I'm nothing. And so to, to answer your question, I, I love my products because they're cool, they help me do good things, they put a smile on my face. But at the end of the day, I, I don't really care. What, what, I'm a business journalist and I'm really excited by the things, the differentiated way that this company has behaved as a, as a company. And, and, and I've gotten very excited about my quest to explain that. Adam Lashinsky, thank you very much. Thank you, Angie.